Welcome to this week's video tutorial. I've been asked to take a look at Michael McGoldrick's trip to Hervey's. So here's a bit of a challenge. Um, usually I show you what I am playing and how I'm playing stuff. This week we will try and um, look at how somebody else plays something. So Michael McGoldrick has a very recognizable and um, amazing style of his own. Very smooth. So I have the big challenge to emulate that, um, which is basically inimitable. So uh, let's just see how it goes. I've analyzed uh, what he does in terms of technique, in terms of phrasing, and we're going to take a look at that bit by bit. So we have a very smooth start. As usual, Michael McGoldrick doesn't use uh, staccato as much or as heavily as I or Brian Finnegan, for instance, would do. It's a lot of legato phrasing. That's the beauty of his style. Um, he uses tonguing at very special moments and he uses also a lot of cuts and finger ornamentation to give that some emphasis and some dynamic. So, first phrase. You see there's a lot of space there, a lot of legato movement. Let's see what it is exactly. So. There's, I think, most of the time, some tongue in here to just give it some structure, some sort of structure. So, see, there's two tongues there in this section. So just looking at this section here, we, we can see that some, some notes are cut and emphasized by some, some uh, tonguing to separate them, and some notes are tonguing plus uh, a cut to jump onto them. Now it's very difficult to give you a simple rule on where does apply. It doesn't always happen at the same moment um, that you can just define like that and then you just copy paste it uh, like a computer program. So all I can ask for is to, to pay attention. I'm gonna play it several times quite slowly and to just learn exactly, transcribe exactly bit for bit where those tonguing and cutting places occur uh, to get a feel for it yourself. It, you really need to develop a feel for it. Uh, it's, I can't tell you it's always there or always there. So here we go again. faster. So here we see one of those very open sort of cuts that he often does um, that, that show a lot of great control over what your fingers are doing. So there's always places also where you can take a breath, um, like these little places where you can then syncopate uh, after it, or uh, just create a, a, a sort, short moment of silence, like a bump in the melody, then take back over. But you need to find a lot of those moments by just playing over it, trying out several, several places. So that's how I did it. I literally went out there and looked for the right places to take a breath and how to get back into the melody. Because a lot of players find it difficult. They, they say, okay, I'm slowly running out of breath. Often then you speed up, you start to speed up the melody because uh, you're kind of slowly starting to panic about your breath. 
and because you want to get to a moment where you know how to take the breath and how to get back into the melody. So what I'm doing is actively creating those moments where I do know. That way you slowly get a feel for really how to get back in and out of the melody by taking notes out to breathe there and so that it's not always the same place. You should really never breathe always at the same place because it's, it will st start to stick out and it will start to sound monotonous and uncreative. So that's something we find a lot in Michael McGoldrick explaining this cut and then especially with this finger on the on the bottom hand to a bounce like practice these bounces by going from the slow to the fast they don't come self-evidently for most players so you just really need to go slowly The way it feels for me when I'm doing them is like I'm not really pressing them, I'm not really trying hard to, to bounce it off like a, a, like a solid piece of wood or a drumstick, but I'm imagining a very, very large uh, stick, so to say, uh, my fingers from wood, but bendy kind of wood. So it's like just dong bending off um, or like uh, vibrating off the, the whistle when I'm, when I'm hitting it. So really like... and my hand staying quite relaxed while I'm doing that. If you're trying to stiffen your hand too much to get a really crisp um, bounce, often what will happen is that you won't get any bounce, that your finger just gets stuck or glued to the whistle. So always try and make it very open. Don't worry too much about having them too tight at the start. So from here we go into the repetition of the part. You can end it on the higher F in this case, or higher D, or you can end it on the lower one. What he does on several recordings and live playings is he ends it already there on the higher note, but you can end it also on the lower one. So. Here we go. When I play this tune for the first time round, I try and play it, if I try to emulate his style, very plain very devoid of many acrobatics. I focus more on the groove, I focus on the cleanliness of the finger movement and I show that I have very much control over the melody, the melodic flow, rather than on the ornamentation or much of the mouth articulation and, and, and staccato. If you want to try and play in Michael McGoldrick's style, you should always focus really on the, the internal flow, the being really well tied and locked on, on the beat and show great control of the rhythm, the internal rhythm of, of, of the piece by using your fingers and not overdo it. So really be in the flow, be in the groove of the tune and, and don't think too much about ornamentations or wild variations. Just let the tune settle by itself at the start. Use the first, first time, even second time around the tune or especially the A parts to settle down in the melody, establish what's the bass melody. And only then, in the third time round, fourth time round or so, just ease into the one spot that delivers itself the best for you to go off on a, on a long note, on a little run, on some sort of a, a, a variation that, that can be a bit jazzy if you want, or also, like Mike Michael does plenty of very trally variations that are clever and not overdone, so don't try and make a variation that's like super long. Go for little bits, little changes, little clever changes. That's that's all about it. Michael McGoldrick's playing is about being clever, making small, subtle choices all the time that are uh, just amounting to very, very pleasant um, variation of, of the melody at all moments. Um, and then have one big fireworky sort of uh, variation that, that comes in some even an improv moment um, but I would say it's totally fine with his sort of style to establish your own variation your own thing pre-practice that and don't necessarily go into too much of the improv proper improv but like have some part of the melody that fits well and that doesn't um, destroy so to say the, the melody that's established and go off on that and prepare that 
um, so to, just to keep the flow. It's nothing worse than to have this really nicely established tune with a lot of flow, a lot of great control of what you're actually doing, and then try too hard on uh, some sort of improvisation bit or variation bit uh, that then destroys that flow. So really try and, and, and keep it to keep it simple in, in that one, I would say. Then, how we go the first time into the B part, not too spectacular, just from the A part. So what I'm having here is like one of those very pronounced rolls. With a cut and um, uh, tonguing, as a short roll basically. And then here I land again with a so t and then jump, jump. Here again, this descending bounce. very well the, the typical pattern that Mikolik often uses, a lot of legato, which is going up the scale, really. And then... There's a bit more tonguing going on here to, to give it some, some sort of structure, a little bit of difference from the very, very legato part, the very, very legato sort of playing that dominates most of that part. Passage. That's again very legato at the start. And then the later half of that is very pronounced. We have the linking part, which is just to scale up, very legato again. passage here. We have this counterweight to the very legato part again with, with a lot of more tonguing and, and more pronunciation, more edge. phrase again back into the A part. Then 
then the second time round, the A part, you can introduce a few different motives, as I said before, small things, small clever things. Um, you notice probably in most of the recordings there are from this tune played by McGoldrick, you'll find that the first time round, the A part, he goes. Versus the first time round, the A part, in the second time round, the tune. So it's with the passage coming back from, from underneath and then the other one, the most well known and what's mostly played in sessions. is a main difference uh, to most of the repetitions of the A part. Again, not major changes, some subtle things going on there like... Just a little roll there, a long roll instead of a short roll, something like that. Small little things. Then we have the first big big change or first big fireworks. It's when the whole entire B part goes up into the second octave. Just introduced mostly in his playing with, with a run up that's very nicely introducing that, that feeling. So after this run he chooses to hold the first note a bit to give that run some, some weight and some more presence and importance. And also you'd find often with a lot of players actually that there's a bit more staccato in the second octave than in the first because it just gives you that more attack on certain notes and to be sure you get them clean. And also um, just much of the staccato just comes nicer with the more back pressure that you need for the second octave. So here, something that I do, and I'm not quite sure because I don't see it that much on the videos, um, that he does is in the first part, in the first uh, octave, I use this finger here to do the cutting, whereas in the second octave, I would use this finger here to do the cutting on most of the upper hand. So, whereas in the first octave, it would be give it a bit more definition. In the second octave, I switch to this finger. Because if I use this one in the second octave, on my whistle it sounds like this. Sometimes it's not as clean as I like, but then it depends on your whistle, depends on you, depends on your taste. So the second part in the second octave is basically almost the same. You just have this run at the start and then um, you can introduce a few other little changes maybe as well to highlight it a bit more. so on and so forth. So as you as usual I will play the tune around a bit uh, with a D whistle now also that those of you that do not have an F whistle can also play along to it.
thank you very much again and I hope this will serve you well and if you have any questions or comments about this or any you want any more information about what I think how Michael McGoldrick does some of the stuff he does then just don't hesitate and send me a message.